How should we live when we are old? That's the question that I would like us to ask ourselves. And those of you who are young, I hope you will realize that this is, lies ahead of you. And those of us who are old, I hope it will be of instructiveness to you and uh, a way of how you should conduct your years, your aged years. And I think it's an increasingly important question because we are getting older in our country today. 39 million Americans or 13% of the U.S. population is currently 65 or older. That's quite a, a pretty good percentage. Compared to 4%, that was that case in 1900. So in a century, you find that increasing and it will increase to 20% by 2050. That uh, developed countries, that's what happens. Better medicine, we live longer, especially in our country, the fertility rate has decreased. So their percentages are going to change. But in developed countries, that's the case. I think Japan still uh, is involved in the expected life of a male is 74. Uh, that's pretty uh, long life as far as averages are, are concerned. But it is something that more and more people are in this age group of being old. I didn't ask you if you felt old. I didn't ask you if you are having problems when people give you the elderly discount and you don't think you deserve it. And I'm not telling you how you feel when you go through a drive-thru and they don't even see you, they hear your voice and they give you the discount. That's when you have arrived. But the, the discounts are good. Uh, we'll, we'll take them, but it's interesting how people go through young age to middle age, you'll have to deal with those issues. And when you're, you're two generations behind, when you see young people, you think, well, that's, you find out that's the granddaughter, or that's the, you think, well, that's supposed to be the daughter. Uh, those things happen. And life is interesting, and I want us to all realize that we're still in the image of God when we're old. And I think there ought to be respect for that because we've lived a long time in the image of God when we grow old. And so when we think about that as a, a, a question, how should we live when old? What does God say about that that might, might help us? It is also important because we may rely on our young years on our physical strength. But that can take place when we're young, we lose that strength. But that's what gives us that self-dependency. We're, we're able to function with our, by ourselves. But when we grow older, what happens is that, that a lot of times that physical strength decreases. That's uh, what we realize. And so what happens when that happens and our dependency upon others increase? We don't like that, but it's a, it's a reality. How should we live when we're facing declining strength, but realize that we may have to give up our independence because of our, of our needs. And it's interesting when Pew did a research upon how do you feel, do you feel your age and, and what that is supposed to, to be. As people grow older, the majority of people feel 10 to 15 years younger than their age, according to to interviewing 2,900 some odd Americans. And that always interested me because you, know, you expect sometimes always be, you know, be feeling good, but when you get older, you realize, hey, I don't feel like I used to. But you also need to realize that who did they interview? People who could still talk on the phone and carry on a conversation. They didn't talk to people in nursing homes. They couldn't get to them. And so when they began to interview the ones they are dependent upon, they tell you the story about the difficulties and that, that I gap decreases quite a bit. But one thing is true, you, you lose your physical abilities as you get older, you still do things, but you don't do it as quick. And sometimes you may lose those and you have to start thinking about uh, others and depending upon others. How do you live when you're old? And I want us to see from Psalm 71 some answers to that question. Seven, Psalm 71 is written from the viewpoint of an old man. 
an older person. Could it be David? Well, he surely wrote Psalm 70, but there's no name given to this particular account, but it would fit well with David in his life. But we know it is indeed a, an older person. We see that from two verses. For example, in verse 9, cast, not off, cast me not off in the time of old age. What is old age? It's a relative term, but we realize that there comes a time when we're old. And that's, that's kind of in, increasing. Young people think, well, it's old when you're, when you're someone's 40 or 50, and then the person that's old says, I'm not old till I'm 75 or something like that. It changes, but there's a sense of old. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. It's part of, of old age. Verse 18, yea, even when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not. What happens when we get older, we we. Our, our hair turns gray. We have the almond-colored blossom tree upon our head. And therefore, there's that sense of growing old. And this is a psalm written from the standpoint of a person that has grown older. Should an older person be respected as far as God is concerned? This is where young people, I think, need in our day and time to realize that here is a, a special place a person in life. And God says they ought to be respected. They ought to be praised in a sense of honored. Leviticus 19 and verse 32, written to the Old Testament Jews, part of the old law. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, that white-headed person, and honor the face of the old man. What's interesting, he connects that with reverence for God. Thou shalt fear God. I am Jehovah. Does God always want us to have a generation gap? It's an interesting question. And society will treat everybody alike. Why should I respect the older person any more than the younger person? Get out of the way. You're going too slow. We're, we're, I need to get somewhere. Why should there be a respect because we will not have any gaps. God recognizes gaps and he honors it. He honors differences when Paul writes to Timothy, we're to, we're to treat older women as our mothers, older men as our fathers. We're to treat our, our, our brethren, these are younger men, as brothers, and uh, younger women as sisters with all purity. He recognizes the difference, not only in the sexes, <clears throat> but also in time in which they are living, how you respect them, how you treat them. How do you address an older person? We say, oh, we, we're lacking manners in our modern society, and that's true. But as godly people, parents, do you teach your younger people to address Older people with respect and honor their faiths and what you say to them. We don't even say Uncle, you know, we don't say Johnny when that's our uncle. We say Uncle Johnny. We put something of respect recognizing not only relationship, but they're older. We don't call them Johnny. And here's an older person. They're not just your buddy. They're not uh, uh, just a friend, but there's respecting the hoary head and honoring their face, and it comes out in how we address them, how we treat them, maybe how we dress before them. We're gonna go see an older person. Do you give the dignity of how you're going to dress when you go see them? You're gonna dress sloppy and say, hey, hey buddy, how you doing? And God says, old age needs to be respected. And Psalm 71 says, here's how I feel. Here's what is inside me as an older person, and I think, this is the, is the secret, it's revealed, but it is a secret of how you live when you're old, when your health is declining, when it may be gone, and when nobody else has any respect for you, if that ever happens. But we know among God's people, we'll always respect the older person and understand that. So what does he tell us? One thing that's interesting to me, you don't quit. 
as you were young, you continue as you're old to continue to take refuge in God. Look at Psalm 71 and verse 3. Be thou to me a rock, not just for vacationing. Be a rock of habitation. This is where I live. Like little rabbits digging into the holes of the, of the ground. This is, you're my rock. This is where I live. Where to, unto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Now here's a trust in God. He is my rock. The passage was read this morning. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. Why? He is my refuge. But I'm abiding upon him and him as a rock of, of his salvation, a habitation, that when difficulties come, I can rely upon my rock. He will never fail me. He will never demand get a, get a number and come to me when it's more convenient for me. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. When nobody else can help me. Or nobody may be willing to help me. That's where the older person has that inward strength and comes to God. You are my rock. As he prays here for deliverance, for rescue from harm. We find that this is what gives him that, that confidence. And it continues. Look at verse 5. He's my hope. For thou art my hope, O Lord Jehovah. Thou art my trust from my youth. It hadn't changed. Yes, got gray head. Now, didn't have that before. Losing my strength a little bit. Didn't have, I had all my strength back in those young days and all that sort of thing. But I've continued to trust in you, O oh God, through all the seasons of my life. It doesn't change now. And you are my hope. Verse 14, I will hope continually. And will praise thee yet more and more. Do you see the positive nature of this old person's heart? I do. Why? Because his strength's failing. David couldn't keep warm with the clothes because his body is always cold. And he thought this is, this is just wonderful. When here's the one who could kill a bear and a lion with his hands and now can't even keep himself warm. Has to have a maiden to keep him warm. Things change. But hope continues. Hoping for the expectations of God's righteousness to be re re manifested in his life. Saving him from this particular problem with his enemies. And it continues to do that. And I will praise thee yet more and more. Because of what... God does. And there is the continuance. It doesn't stop. And this is why it's important to come to God in time of youth. Ecclesiastes addresses this. Remember thy creator when, the, when you're young. Before the evil days come, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Your strength fails. Maybe people fail you. They don't want to be around you. They don't come to see you as often as they should. And all of those things, you, you begin to realize these days aren't good. And you might blame God. But from your youth, you've trusted in him. He's been that continual place of refuge and habitation. And you can rely upon him in times of trouble. That continues. You've learned that from your youth. And you're not going to be put to shame in your old age. Because a lot of things are going to fail you. But God will not. Secondly, why then are you a complaining old person? I'm not saying we have any here. In fact, we've got wonderful older people, but you know the stereotype. Always complaining. I go see them, they're always complaining. We, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that woman. And the point is, is that as a Christian, you don't have to be that person. I am a wonder to many, but thou art my strong refuge. I said, why aren't you complaining? I know you've got some physical ailments. I'm a Christian. God is my refuge. I'm going to praise him yet more and more. And you will be a wonder because 
What do we think of old men? Cranky old men, don't we? That's the stereotype. But it doesn't have to be that way. What gives you the secret? What gives you the what? There, you are a wonder to people because they know they have may not have experienced that, but maybe older ones they know what this is tough. More than one older preacher has told me, Jerry, it takes a lot of courage to get old. And there's a lot of truth to that. The things we don't even think about. We're now having to purchase them. And I think about that as job. Things happen. And difficulties occur. But the point is you don't have to be living constantly as a complainer, dear Christian. Do you? It doesn't mean that you're dishonest with your, how your health is going. And that's where, where brethren come in. When people ask you how you're doing, you say, pretty well, pretty good. And you say, well, why would they want to hear my complaints? Nobody wants to hear complaints. So we go through that battle. But brethren have compassion. They have a tender heart. They care. And there's a one place that you say, here's what's really happening to me. Then you'll have an ear from a Christian. You should. And they're not going to accuse you of being a complainer all the time. Because deep down you have a strength and it comes out in a very positive attitude about, hey, I'm, my refuge is in God. And because of that, you can, you can overlook the things that are happening to you. When those are difficult things to overlook. We also need to understand that, secondly, we're never going to be forsaken by God when forsaken by others. Sometimes people grow older and have no one to care for them or even interested in them. Verse 9 says, cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For my enemies speak concerning me, and they that watch for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken them. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver. Oh, you have just made a big mistake if that's what you think about the Christian older person. Because their refuge is in God. He will never forsake. But sometimes people will look, oh, how tough you've got it. And there's no one caring for you. They may want to take advantage of you. And it is a time from the worldly standpoint, they wonder at you. They say, well, no, he, God must be against them. Look how he's cursed them with, their, with health and a lack of health. All those things. But you're not forsaken by God because that's not the point about being forsaken or not. You're going to grow older. That's the process. He understands and says we're to respect that. But what keeps you going and realize that you're not forsaken when health declines is the fact that God is indeed your, your refuge. And that's what he says. Oh God, be not far from me. Oh my God, make haste to help me. And he's there all the time. And he'll never forsake you. <laughs> Hebrews the 13th chapter. The emphasis upon not to have a love for money. What's, what's your sense of, of power in our world today? It's money. Money gives me power. What happens when you're old and you don't have any more money? You ran out of money. Health problems cause you use it quicker than you saved it. Where is your refuge in? He said, well, they are not only deserted, they, they, they don't have any more money or anything. It's sad. But why aren't they complaining? It's because God hasn't forsaken them. We notice in verse 5 of Hebrews 13, be free from the love of money, content with such things as you have. Doesn't mean I'm happy about my situation, but I'm sufficient. Because I have God. Content with such things as you have, for himself has said, I will in no wise fail thee, nor in any wise forsake thee. So with good courage we say, the Lord is my helper. I will 
not fear. Psalm 118 verse 6 is that the Lord is on my side. That's why I don't fear. What shall man do unto me? I've known him since I was young. He's never forsaken me in my middle years. He's not going to forsake me now. And there's the plea of, of confidence in God. Make haste to come deliver me. Forsake me not. And we have the confidence that God will not forsake us. And you wonder how come someone in a nursing home that no one seems to care about, how can they keep going? It's because they've never been forsaken by God. And they can lie in their bed and they can go through times when I've seen where older people's beds were, were wet and not changed and you wonder what kind of care they're getting. They're still not forsaken by God. An older person can go through those difficult times where they've lost all their money, they've lost their health, depending upon others that don't seem to really care about them. And you're not going to hear them complain. Why? Because God hadn't forsaken me. And he will deliver me. Thirdly, the older person continues to grow, continues to grow in praise for God. Growing up and in our family, we kind of check our ears, see how they're growing. Because you get older, your ears grow, don't they? I used to think that my great granddaddy had some big ears. As he would go out in the in, in farm and, and he'd, he'd have them, I said, well, and my ears were little. I'm, I'm checking them every day. Am I going to have those ears? But uh, things grow and they get big. But, but what comes from within is what's important. We grow in our praise for God. And this is seen, look at verses. 14 through 18. This is, a, this is a, a theme throughout this psalm. That it's not so, well, I've, I've, I've praised God in my youth and I've given him praise and worship and, and it's, 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 it's going to decrease from now. No, it's going to grow. And it increases more and more. I will hope continually and I will praise thee yet more and more. Who's saying this? An old person is saying it. My mouth shall tell of thy righteousness and of thy salvation all the day for I know not the numbers thereof I can't tell you how many times he's helped me through difficult times as we grow older we they increase so we praise him yet more and more each day that we grow closer and closer to seeing him in heaven and that amazes me that when God speaks about the older person, it's not the idea whether they're declining, declining, declining. And we don't think of them much as far as serving others, but the old person speaks up. He wants to tell the new generation. Verse 18, yea, when I am old and gray-headed, O forsake me not until I have declared thy strength unto the next generation. Don't kick me out of the ministry. Oh, I didn't think we're, I didn't know we were talking about preachers today. I'm talking about Christians. I'm not closing up shop. I've got some more things to say to a younger generation. I want to talk to them what makes you strong. It's not money. It's not how people take care of you or anything that they will respect you. I'll tell you how God's taken me this far. And even in all of my troubles, God is there to strengthen me. I want God, don't let me leave without telling the next generation how great God is. Does that sound like a person's closing shop? Not to me. They're old. They declined in physical strength. But they still got a lot of heart. And he says, I want to tell the next generation of that. I want to declare it unto them. 
And young people, you ought to listen to how God has gotten people through times of depression, times of calamity in their life. The world's turned upside down. It'll help you because the next generation needs to, needs to know, as he says, thy might to everyone that is to come. You need to know that. Well, what should I praise him in? The psalm ends this way. I will also praise thee with a psaltery. It's the Old Testament of worshiping unto God with instruments of music. Why? Even thy truth, O God. I will praise thee for thy truth. I think he might be meaning here his faithfulness. Not only objective truth, which his word pr pr produces and is. But it's the idea of, of thy truth. You've been faithful. I will sing praises unto thee with the harp. O, the, o thou holy one of Israel. Here is his holiness. And when you live in a world that is full of corruption and darkness and sin, it's nice to be able to go with, to refuge to one that is perfectly holy. See the things I ought to be thinking about in my bed. Thinking about at night when I can't go to sleep. Thinking about when I'm just with my thoughts all day and not conversing with anyone else. Thinking about God's faithfulness and his holiness. He says, O thou holy one of Israel. And in verse 23, my lips shall shout for joy when I sing praises unto thee. That's an old person. Shouting with joy of praises un unto God. And so his holiness, his faithfulness, his power and his redemption when thou which thou hast redeemed david had been delivered a lot of times he's praying that god will deliver him yet again and when i finish the song i have a different view of the older godly person that's a wonder to many because they don't fit the stereotype where they're always complaining. They want to talk to you about how faithful God has been. And the secret is, is they know God will never forsake them because he's true, he's faithful. And I can continue to live a life separated from the world because he's holy and because of the wonderful theme of redemption. I want to close by thinking as we grow older what should we grow fonder of verse 17 says O God thou hast taught me from my youth and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works what should be the most wonderful work that God has done as you think about growing older. Oh, you lived a full life. There's probably a lot of times you face death in the eye and you think that's got to be it. And that uh, very important times in our life. But when you look at the whole picture of things, we can be delivered from death and from circumstances and I thought I, I didn't have a job and God, God found me a job and, and things just worked together and I praise God for that. That's what's wonderful. When all said and done, to look at it from eternity standpoint. And I think when he says, when he speaks about here redemption, we could take that. Not being redeemed from the enemies of the Philistines. Not talking about this world, but something that is overriding. Why God sent his son in the first place? You get a hold of eternal things. I think the redemption that is found in Christ is so paramount that that is something, that's a wondrous work that God did. That would be something to meditate upon as we grow older. Romans 3, 23 and 24 Tells us of all of our, our situation. We've all been doing this, especially as we come of age and we're young. We've fallen short of God's glory. We've sinned. 
but there's redemption. When he says, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption from what? Sin. Where we've been cleansed from our sins by his blood. That's a wondrous work. Especially from a holy God that can overlook sin. You see that in the rest of Romans 3. He had to be just with sin, but he wants to justify the sinner. So he took the death of Christ. Shed his blood to cleanse us from all of our sins. That is God's plan. That's why you read in the Old Testament the lambs being offered, the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, all those things are, are prefiguring what God said was really important. And what was the idea of, of being something that had to be done. And he planned people, and he planned for it. He brought people along for that purpose. But there's also redemption from the grave. That Jesus provided in that same book in Romans 8 and verse 23 and 24. Not only so, but ourselves also have the first fruits of the spirit. Think about the Christian. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. We're not overlooking the pain and the difficulty we're going through. We groan within ourselves waiting for our adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now this takes us beyond the grave. It takes us into eternity and the Lord comes back again and raises us up in an incorruptible body as the, in the image of his glorious body. And we go to heaven for, for eternity. This is the great plan. This is a wondrous work that a lot of things you can't number everything God does and maybe he's done for your life. But as you grow older and get closer and closer to the grave and eternity in heaven, I think that would be a wonderful thing to think about. That says, more and more, I want to praise thee more, God. Because I'm not as strong as I used to be and I may not have much to offer you, but I can speak about your wondrous works and I can tell the next generation about you Use me. Even in my limited circumstances. But deep down when nothing else seems to be work, I'll be thinking about this. Because I'll have the redemption. I know redemption from the graves like redemption from sin is found in Jesus Christ. And I will be faithful to him and talk about him all the days of my life. Helps you get through things. But what a comfort when you come to the end. I think you can look at this psalm and you can say this psalm a lot of different times in your old age, but especially on your deathbed. When you realize there's no more, there might not be more hours given to you. You've been longing for a long time for God to take you. It's what older people do that are living godly lives. But you're okay that he's allowed you to, to stay. He gives you another day to talk about his marvelous grace. But think about his request. Verse 1, make haste, O God, to deliver me. Deliver me what? I'm ready to go home. Make haste to help me, O Jehovah. Let them be put to shame and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward. That's, that's Psalm 70, verse 41 and 71. In thee, O Jehovah, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. And here's the passage. Deliver me in thy righteousness and rescue me. From the Philistines, David, yeah, that worked. Deliver me in thy righteousness, rescue me from sin, thou work. But also work when you're just praying silently to God and realize it's the end and I'm okay with that. Could say to God, deliver me in thy righteousness and rescue me from this body. 
bow down thy ear unto me and save me. Take me home. It's okay. And at that moment, what a comfort it is to know the God you've known from your youth has not forsaken you in your old age. He's giving you these times in old age and older people statistically are going to be living longer and longer and longer. More and more opportunities. More opportunities to complain about your aches and pains and all the things that happened to you and all the things bad that happened to you. But no, but more and more opportunity to praise him because he's been my refuge. He's never forsaken me. I want to tell you about the wondrous God that's delivered me time and time again. And I know that in those silent moments when we're ready to give up our spirit, God, come down here. Hear my plea. Rescue me. Save me from this body and take me home. A wonderful life to live as a Christian. And it's okay to grow older. It's okay to grow old. It's okay to lose your strength. And when circumstances are so difficult, what keeps you going? What keeps you not complaining? What keeps you continually to praise God? What continues to say, I'm going to take an opportunity to talk about the strength of God to a younger generation? What keeps you hopeful and that grows every day is the fact that you're a child of God and you're following the God who's revealed himself to you. If you haven't started that trip yet as a Christian, we encourage you, become a Christian. Be saved from your sins, knowing you'll be saved from the grave. And you can live life through your young years, middle age, and the old years, even to the day of your death, with the confidence that God is right there with you. Why not start that life as a Christian as we stand and sing? Please come.